Welcome back to Sociology 226. This is W.E.B. Du Bois, video two. In this video, I've got four goals. First, I want to look to Du Bois's threefold conceptualization of race. Next, I want to look to Du Bois's shifting politics of education. Lastly, I want to think about Du Bois as a sociological forefather before getting you ready to do your two paragraph submission. Let's do it, starting with Du Bois on race. Though Du Bois' understandings of race changed throughout his career, we can distill at least three elements in how he thinks about race, racial hierarchy, and what we can do about it. First, Du Bois is consistent that he does not think that heredity, in terms of passed down attributes, gives a realistic or full understanding of race. Here we can say that racial essence is not simply found in characteristics defining a part of the human species. Rather, we have to look elsewhere, namely to the two other attributes that I've outlined here. He will argue that attempts to find the certainty of race in biology are often explanations that try to define social inferiority in terms of organic characteristics. The eugenic race science of the time is an important aspect of this critique. Whatever race is, it is not inherent. Despite some changes in Du Bois's thought, that race is political and should be a place of politics does not change. In his early work, Du Bois wonders how we can educate black America as a whole and raise its level of education to that we see in white America. The point is to even out racial competition. In his later work, he emphasizes the historical conditions which have produced the races and the inequality that has led to the current racial order. We might say that he's taken a move from a race as a social fact position to a more Marxist understanding of how historical forces have produced the caste system in which we now live. Regardless of whether we think about race as a space of competition or a space of oppression, we must take political action to improve our lot, which is what Du Bois does in his public work and political activity. Hence his role in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and his lifelong writings on the role of education. Most important here is the role of history. Finally, as he's doing the politics of racial equality, Du Bois understands racial categories historically. This contributes to the anti-biological position. Here we can situate Du Bois himself. He was classified as the third category you see on the slide. Please do not use this term. I only use it here to show you how racial categories are historically emergent. It is now taken to be archaic because of its association with imperial race division and race science. However, we can use this word in historical context to show that certain races, i.e. whiteness, have varied over time. In this case, being classified as such allowed Du Bois certain privileges that others in his time, being darker skinned, did not have. Not only is the color line about the gains and losses about being in one category or another, it is also about the categorization process itself as a historical one. This historical angle is going to come up again and again in Soci 226 and Soci 227. Du Bois was also a methodological pioneer. That is, in the method we use to do sociology, of race, education, or anything else. Writing at the same time as Durkheim and Weber, Du Bois' work is both quantitative and qualitative, theoretical and applied. Not only is Du Bois a theorist of race, thinking about what it is and what it might become, he is also a methodological pioneer. In doing his sociology of race in urban and rural locations, he mobilizes quantitative data on the racial categories, on work and domestic labor, on the amount of property owned and by whom, among whites and blacks in the area studied, etc. He attends the World's Fair in Paris in 1900 to show off this stuff, which I'll get to in the next slide. In his work on race in Philadelphia and Atlanta, he starts to use other methods than those we've seen in Durkheim and Weber, like questionnaires and other ethnographic methods, meaning he described his own experiences of being situated in the field. Lastly, autobiography. In three separate autobiographies, Du Bois inserts himself into the sociology of race, work, and education. He subtitles Dusk of Dawn, 1940, as an autobiography of race. Du Bois also does something that neither Marx, Durkheim, nor Weber do, which is rely a great deal on his own experience to phrase his sociology of race. While The Souls of Black Folk doesn't detail the race question the same way as Durkheim, he does narrate his experience of race in various institutions, particularly educational ones, in that book, especially Chapter 4 of The Meaning of Progress. 
We can say that Du Bois used his experience to frame statistics about race by showing how he lived through them. This is a very different approach than that taken by Durkheim, by defining society as an objective structure outside of our consciousness. What is especially interesting is how this interpretation changed over time, in his older works and with changing politics. In his Philadelphia and Atlanta studies, government reports, and his political work, Du Bois employed sociology to practical ends. Sociology is not a science of mere interpretation, like Weber would hold. Rather, Du Bois saw sociology as a method through which to interrogate and challenge the taken-for-granted and legally supported segregation going on in America. He would help found the NAACP in the belief it would be able to promote education and better social conditions for black Americans, and was very critical of the group when it started to represent the beliefs of a newly emerging black middle class. I'll be talking about two popular pieces in its periodical, The Crisis, later in this video. So, like Marx, and unlike Durkheim and Weber, Du Bois was very actively involved in politics, and he saw the science of sociology as a method through which to improve the world, at least in his younger liberal days. Du Bois traveled to Paris in 1900 to the World's Fair to popularize the new science of sociology. On this slide, you can see three separate images from Du Bois's Paris exposition, where he bought a steerage ticket to show off the new science of sociology and the sociology of race relations in the southern United States to fairgoers. You can see all these images online, I'll post the link on OnQ, but I wanted to show you that Du Bois is in the middle of the action the sociology was taking off, and also the way that he undertook data visualization to new places in 1900. All of the items were hand-colored, brought by him across the ocean, and are showing off the work that he did as part of his Atlantis studies. They were really innovative, and the data very beautifully displayed, as you can see. Alongside his sociology of race and racialization, Du Bois is very interested in the politics of education. Du Bois wrote on education throughout his career. Not only is he a sociologist of race then, but he also put the sociology to work in his political practice, especially given the historical backdrop of racial segregation. Du Bois was a strong believer in the university model, albeit modified slightly in the case of historically black colleges. Remember, the segregation of education meant that black students went to historically black colleges. So, if this is the case, what's the best way to educate people? For Du Bois, a university should be a university. Black, white, whatever. The point was to connect people with traditions of thought that have been taught throughout the years. This was not the only opinion at the time about the politics of black education we can see a contrast between Du Bois's university model and the practical education model held by Booker T. Washington. Washington was a leader of the black community at the turn of the century. While he was born into slavery in Virginia, he worked in agriculture and was educated at a seminary school. He would later become the head of the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Washington and Du Bois would often collaborate, but also clash in the type of education they supported. Du Bois wanted university education and political rights. Washington, on the other hand, supported practical instruction, moral education through hard work that would improve the lot of black Americans. Washington's more conservative approach succeeded in enrolling the support of many, including then-President Teddy Roosevelt. These two very different educational philosophies can be seen in his so-called Atlanta Compromise to focus on skills training rather than to challenge Jim Crow laws. No race can prosper till it learns there is as much dignity in tilling a field as in writing a poem. It is at the bottom of life we must begin, not at the top. Washington's position is to say, look, there is no freedom without work in this economy. We need to get the skills we need, and then we can look to political action. Now, I think it's easy to pick a side here, but Du Bois himself would wonder exactly how possible it was to replicate a classic university, given the constraints facing historically black colleges. So it isn't a strict one versus the other fight, as Du Bois's position would shift on this point. Here I'll outline the transition in Du Bois's thought over a period of 30 years. To do so, let's go back to the souls of black folk. Du Bois spends a chapter in the souls of black folk outlining his opposition to Washington's compromise. In the piece, he takes a controversial tone about the chances of Washington's approach working. How can we, without political rights, actually consolidate the gains of hard work? Given the amount of debt taken on by sharecroppers, is it possible to get ahead through hard work at all? In Souls, he also documents the history of the Freedmen's Bank, made up of the wealth of former slaves and its failure, leaving the life savings of many empty. He suggests that failing to agitate politically means a repeat of the situation over and over. 
Even worse, as you see here, he also argues that the compromise suggests it is a problem with black workers and not the structure of work in the United States that is the chief problem to be solved. Hence the quote on the slide. The point. Without political rights, hard work will not improve the lives of black America. We should direct education to promote them. Washington, of course, disagrees, as did much of America at the time, it should be noted. Neither Washington nor Du Bois was fully victorious, says the literature. Du Bois's position on the sociology of education changes as he becomes more radical. Du Bois's politics change significantly over time. While the lot of much of black America improves somewhat, the state of historically black colleges is still not very good, and it is not to this day. However, there are some notable differences in Du Bois's position. Initially, Du Bois thought that higher education would produce a so-called talented tenth that would be able to produce political rights and lead black America ahead. He abandons this thought as his politics proceed leftward. Rather than be led by an educated few, the goal was class consciousness among black America, solidarity with other people excluded throughout the world and the history of imperialism. This then means a move closer to the thought of Karl Marx, looking at the historical conditions that have provided us with the reality in which we dwell. This does not mean we should abandon education, because education provides us the means to achieve the actual rights and the material conditions that oppressed people have been historically denied. Finally, as the quote shows, the language Du Bois uses shifts from one to improve the black community as a whole to one that challenges the segregation facing black America. It isn't simply a description of the racial makeup of the country, Rather, it is a focus on the caste system facing black people in the United States of America. Although not a central focus of his work, Du Bois did do some writing on gender and its intersections with race. The intersections of gender and race links the work of W.E.B. Du Bois to the work of Patricia Hill Collins that you were going to read in the last week of 226. In the early politics of Du Bois and many others, considering the backdrop of slavery and emancipation, the focus was on the rights of men and the voting rights of the newly freed population. In many cases, as we will see in the last week, there were numerous women who were at the head of the freedom movement. In The Damnation of Women, Du Bois revisits the roles played by Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth in the Black Rights Movement, and about the challenges faced particularly by black women in the 1930s. He addresses being forced to choose between economic participation and raising a family, about the inability for a politics which divide the sexes to work in the 1930s. So with Du Bois's move to the left, he begins to treat the intersections of gendered exclusion and that of the color line at the same time. I think it would be inappropriate to say that he's an intersectional feminist thinker. Hill Collins and Crenshaw are two of the founders of this approach, but that he was aware about the ways that race, power, gender, and privilege produce different experiences of the world and multiply various exclusions. Hence, I write approaching the problems of intersectionality rather than an intersectional approach. The uplift of women is, next to the problem of the color line and the peace movement, our greatest modern cause. When, now, two of these movements, women and color, combine in one, the combination has deep meaning. I want to take this moment to think about Du Bois as part of the classic sociological canon. Traditionally, we include the big three, Marx, Durkheim, and Weber, as the founders of sociological thought. I think in this video, I've made the case that Du Bois deserves to be counted amongst those forefathers. Additionally, Du Bois's focus on race was completely and totally absent in those other thinkers. Du Bois is a classical sociological thinker, and for that reason, I'm included them in this course. In detail, Du Bois addresses racial categorization and its historical genesis. He provides a sociological analysis of imperialism and a critique of empire matching that of Karl Marx. Finally, Du Bois used many methods of modern sociology before its time. His was not simply armchair social theory, but was empirically focused. That's it for me. Now it's your turn. In two carefully worded paragraphs, five to eight sentences in length, and with reference to the readings, one, in your own words, explain Du Bois' sociology of race. Two, show how that sociology of race builds on the work of Marx, Durkheim, or Weber. Remember, I want to see citation of the course readings, not just a summary of the lecture videos.